Hey everyone, welcome. Today I am sharing with you how I manage my major depressive disorder beyond therapy and beyond medication. Welcome to everyone who is watching. I am attempting to stream today on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn as usual, as well as Instagram. So if you are watching, drop a pineapple in the chat and let me know where you are watching from. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, who are you, Rushni, and why are you talking about this? My name is Rushni. I um, am a humor, I create humor-filled healing spaces for Black women. I'm a Black woman healing, and I help other Black women heal too. Today, I am inspired. I'm trying to be really chill right now, so <laughs> bear with me. Today, I'm inspired to share how I manage my depression or what I do when I'm depressed because it is one of the things I get asked about the most in the background. Why, Rushni? I've been on the internet for many years sharing about lots of topics and interwoven in those topics is the fact that over 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, okay? And then ironically, a month ago, let's see, August, two months ago, I was re-diagnosed <laughs> with major depressive disorder, which is why I call this how I manage my depression and not how I cured my depression, because I don't believe my depression is cured, but I do know that I have done an, a stellar job in managing it. Okay. So why do people ask me? The number one question I get from people is, Rushni, I see you out here on the internet, all pineapples and sunshine, but you swear to, to us that you have a depressive disorder diagnosis. What are you doing? How are you doing that? All right. Even recently, I had someone reach out to me and let me know, um, a woman in her 40s, and let me know that she was dealing with depression for the first time in her life. And she was like, ain't you the woman that talk about depression? And ain't you the one I see out here living your best? sunshiny pineapple life, girl, how, which is how, uh, which is what inspired me to do this live today. Okay. So what I'm going to be dropping for you guys is how I, over the years have managed my depression beyond therapy and beyond medication. Okay. That's what we're talking about. Hey, blue Isis. Let me say hi. Oh, you're catching live from Ohio. Thank you. I'm going to give you a quick thing on the look. I've never worn these earrings before. I believe they were a gift from Mika at Fro Plus Fashion. I've never worn them before. I also have this twist out happening, but it's only going to be here for one day because I have an appointment to get a haircut tomorrow because I want my twist outs to have a little bit more purpose and shape. Okay. So thank you for noticing. <laughs> anyway. Oh, disclaimer. Last week, we had all kinds of balloons and weird things, uh, fireworks and stuff popping up on the screens um, during the live, and I didn't know why. It's actually an update from Mac, and I believe I have it turned off. It's called Reactions. However, I can't guarantee that it's turned off. So if you see stuff popping up on the screen, that is why. It's also why I am... am uh, trying not to move too much <laughs> because they're triggered by gestures. Okay. And they've been whiling. I was, I was on a live yesterday on a zoom call with somebody and balloons just kept popping up. Hi, Audrey. Anyway, so let's get into this. If you are a black woman healing specifically, if you are a black woman who is dealing with diagnosed or undiagnosed depression and or low mood, Sit back, relax, share this on your timeline or share it with anyone who you know who needs this. Also stay till the end because as usual, I got a free gift for you, girl. Okay, so let's start with what's depression. Depression is technically a mood disorder, okay? And major depressive disorder is the diagnosed mood disorder. You have to meet five of nine criteria in the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual that uh, people in the field of psychology use to be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And so as I pointed out earlier, I have been diagnosed with MDD, major depressive disorder, twice. I was diagnosed with MDD in 1998. So do the math on that, whatever that is. 
I don't, I don't know, 20, what is that? 25 years? I don't know. A long time ago. Okay. And I was re-diagnosed with MDD in August of this year when I was being tested for ADHD, which I do not have. Okay. So the difference between being sad and depressed. I was on Exodus Summit, which is an online virtual conference this past weekend, and somebody said something, and it totally helped me be able to explain this. The difference between sadness and depression is the difference between the weather and the climate. Okay? The climate is the pervasive experience of the thing over time. And the weather is what's happening that day. Sadness is what's happening that day. Depression is pervasive. That's the simplest way, okay? You could be experiencing depression without being diagnosed. However, I have been diagnosed because I've reached out to professionals, okay? A person who is depressed is not just sad. Their hope is gone. They can't see any reason for this to be a thing, which is why I put on the thumbnail of this video, what's the point? Because people who are living with, by the way, I'm big on words. I never say struggling. I hate when people say struggling. I'm not struggling. Okay, as you guys are going to see, if you have experienced me on the internet, do I look like I'm struggling to y'all? I'm not struggling with depression. I'm living with a pervasive lower mood. Okay, so depression can have lots of factors. They can be biological, right? Like brain chemicals. They can be psychological, like mind and emotional stuff. They can be social factors, okay? Like something happened to you and it was traumatic and it triggered a depressive mood. It can be all of those things and more mixed together, right? That's why there's no standardized treatment for depression and self-discovery is so important. Because, and that's why I want to share this with you guys, not just on, on the live right now, but as a reference for anybody watching this in the future. I'm not telling you what I read about. I'm telling you what I've lived. I'm telling you what I've lived. And I'm telling you things that were not offered to me, if I'm being honest, by mental health professionals. Okay? I'm telling you the answer to how I have such a bright internal light, even though my setting, my mood setting is lower than most people. Okay. So let me tell you my depression story real quick. Um, I was born and raised in the Virgin Islands and I was dissociated most of my upbringing. So if you had asked me back in the day before I realized I was dissociated, I would have told you that my upbringing was fine. I have since done a lot of work in therapy to realize that there were a lot of um, traumas in my upbringing, hence me being dissociated. So when I went away to college, I suffered from a lot of losses, lots of people dying. So imagine a uh, um, 17, uh, 18 year old who just turned 18 going 2000 miles away from her family and having back to back people dying. I uh, did the math and in the span of a decade, I averaged a loved one like family members, friend, like that kind of thing, dying every eight months. So that was a rough season. And that was the first time that I ever realized or would say that I was actually depressed. Um, that, that was the first time I would call it that. Okay. I didn't even know to call it that back in the day. All right. I'm 2000 plus miles away from my family at school. I'm experiencing snow and a different culture for the first time. And all my loved ones are dying and I'm flying back and forth going to funerals. I'm talking about stuff like I was at a family member's funeral and a loved one died. I could still see it. She just fell down in my eye shot over there in the pews and died at the funeral. So somebody else died at somebody else's funeral. Like I was going through that. So needless to say, I was not okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I came here, I live in Missouri, I came here. And of course, when I got that good, good insurance, that good corporate insurance, I went to my doctor and was like something wrong with me. I just suffered through college, if I'm being honest, I suffered through college and I self-medicated. Okay, not with things with um, people and situationships and all of that. Okay, I self-medicated that way, not with, you know, not like medication for real. So when I got my first job, I came to Missouri, went to my primary care physician and was like something wrong with me 
And they were like, yeah, go see the psychiatrist. Okay. So that was round about 1998. And, um, and yes, I'm not old. Let's take a sip on that. Okay. You heard what I said. I said, when I got my first job in 1997, Okay. I just needed that. What the camera wasn't frozen. I just wanted y'all to take a, a look. I said what I said. Okay. So anyway, I go to the psychiatrist and it was everything that you would experience in a movie. It was a old gray building, sparsely furnished, dimly lit, tall floor. Um, listen, and you know this, okay. It just, it just, the black just keeps not cracking. All right. Um, I walk into this guy's office. He's an old white guy with gray hair. He's giving Freud. Okay. Gray suit, gray hair, dark couch sitting across from me, asked me a bunch of questions with a, a notepad in his hand. And he prescribed me medication. I took that medication for the span of two to three months. I don't remember exactly. I did not like how it made me feel. I stopped that medication. A couple, three years later, I had moved away. I was traumatized. My mood was ridiculously low again. I called and asked for my prescription to be renewed, took the medication again for two to three months, did not like how it made me feel, and I got off of it. Now, I am in no way, shape, or form recommend. First of all, let me say this. I am clearly not a mental health professional, you guys. Well, maybe you guys don't know that. I am not. I am a woman living, flowing, and surfing through life with a depression diagnosis. Please. Do not take uh, medical advice from me. I am a stranger on the internet. Please um, check with your medical professionals and mental health professionals. Uh, when you choose to change any of your protocols with anything I'm telling you, okay? I am just here sharing my experience and what has worked for me, not what I think works, what has worked, okay? What I figured out on my own and through a lot of research that I hope can help other people. Not that I hope, let me not say that. Girl, you better own your stuff that I know can help you because I have helped a lot of people in the background with this information over the years. And so I'm about to put it in the foreground, okay? So I took the medication. I did not like it. The reason I personally did not like it is because it, as I remember back then, I said it took away my high, high emotions and my low lows. So I felt great. I felt very like, almost like someone had shut my emotions off. So it was amazing because it definitely raised the ground of my mood on my depression. Like it took away the lows, but it also took, it shaved off the highs. And I didn't like that feeling. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay. So that's my experience with depression and depression medication. Like I said, um, recently, well, let me go back. I started in therapy on and off, and I have been in talk therapy on and off for the past 20 years. I'm currently not working with a therapist right now, but that is a recent development, and I am looking for a, ther a new therapist for reasons, right? Because that's that. So I'm a huge proponent of therapy as well. As I mentioned, I was diagnosed 20 years ago, and then... A few months ago, in August of this year, as a uh, just like a an aside during my ADHD diagnostic, which I do not have ADHD, I went to be diagnosed and they told me I don't have it. Um, they also said, "Yeah, you have major depressive disorder." <laughs> I'm sorry, that made me laugh, and I was like, "Well, that's rude," because you know when I was answering all of these long tests that they were giving me, I told them the truth. I told them what I actually think, okay? I told them what I actually think, not how I'm choosing to live out here and the results of what I'm about to tell y'all. I just told them my baseline. Okay, Veronica is saying, let me look at what you guys are saying. Veronica said, do I, what medication was I prescribed? I don't remember. Unfortunately, Veronica, my coping mechanism of choice in my life that I had to learn was dissociation. There are huge gaps in my memory and I do not, I have a lot of um, negative experiences with medications. Let's just put it that way beyond this depression discussion and I blank out. So if I ever find that information, I will add it to the information box of this uh, 
video. However, whatever it was I took, it was 20, it was the formulation from 20 years ago. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see what else you guys are saying. You're welcome, Veronica. Okay, so let me keep going because y'all know I like to keep it tight and I like to keep it right, okay? So this is something I've noticed. The mental health conversation has increased so much on the internet since when I started. I am not new to this. I am true to this. If you go to my YouTube channel, I have been posting content about being a black Christian woman living with depression for over a decade. Back then, people used to inbox me and tell me they've never seen it. They never seen it. They was like, girl, I ain't never seen no black woman like me admit that she loved the Lord and she has depression and she been to a therapist. I was out here being a unicorn. Nowadays, in the year of our Lord, 2023, it is so common. And when I tell you, I feel myself tearing up just talking about the fact that the discussion has been brought to the forefront. Now, the pandemic pandemonium Pant Pantene Pro-V clearly helped, okay? I think a lot of people are realizing that we have, we, everyone, but especially Black women, we have all kinds of valid vicarious traumas and depress, depressing situations that we can talk about without the stigma and shame. So part of why I think people are, more people are quote unquote depressed is one, more people are talking about it. I don't know what it was about me back in the day. I just, I just, I, I didn't care that my, I didn't know what to do with my natural hair. I got on the internet, I talked about it. I didn't care that I was the only person out here talking about depression. I got on the internet and talked about it. I, I don't, I, I don't know why. Hey, let's talk about it with Mara. Hi. So two things. I don't know. More people may be experiencing depression or more people might just know they're depressed and be willing to talk about it. Also, studies have shown, unfortunately, what you're watching me on right now, which is a screen, is a beautiful way to connect because clearly I'm sharing information with you and you've never met me in real life. At least most of you haven't, right? But unfortunately, studies have shown that the impact of technology and screens is that it increases depression because it has trained people to be less connected in real life, to feel connected, to get the dopamine hits from connection, but not to get the benefits from in real life connections. So that's the other reason why it feels like it's increased. The other reason, like I said, is the pandemic and this pervasive ep epidemic, quote unquote, of loneliness that everybody keeps talking about. And I think that what I said about the screens is part of it, right? Like we don't know how to be with each other. I'm Gen X. And if you are on the internet right now, we are in the biggest social experiment ever because you are getting to see generations younger than you. Now millennials, I'm gonna go with like Gen Z, right? You are getting to see these generations that grew up with social media interact with each other and their social skills The video wasn't frozen. And it's kind of scary because uh, let's say that technology has contributed to an underdevelopment of in-person social skills and communication. Okay, anyway, let's keep going quick. So let's talk about medication and depression um, and then therapy and depression. I am in no way, shape or form telling you not to take your medication. Please take your medication. If your doctor prescribed you medication for your depression, please take it. Medication is super useful. Go and get a physical exam, tell your primary care physician. And medication is amazing, especially when somebody is in the deepest pit of depression, okay? Medication will curb the vegetative symptoms. There's, it, it just will. It'll rearrange your brain chemicals and it'll curb the symptoms. Now, remember what I said at the beginning of this. To me, that felt like it took away the low symptoms, but it also took away the high symptoms. But listen, sometimes you just need something to take away the, the low symptoms because you are on the edge. And girl, let me tell you what, if the medication takes away the low symptoms to the point that you can do the things that I'm about to recommend to you, 
go take your stuff. And don't let nobody tell you not to take your stuff, okay? I personally am medication averse. Like I told you, I've had some bad experiences, not just with this and other parts of my life, but medication is great for raising the floor of your depressive mood, okay? Unfortunately, medication alone is not enough because medication curbs the symptoms, but it doesn't treat and teach the preventative skills that are necessary. So medication only, studies show that when you take medication only and you think that what you're dealing with is a solely biological issue, you have a higher rate of relapse into deep depression. Okay. So here, what I said, I said medication can help, but medication by itself is not going to be the thing that gets you where you want to go. Okay. Same thing with therapy. Therapy is amazing. I am a huge proponent of therapy. One of my best selling shirts in my shop, make sure they get, go to therapist. Okay. I think everybody should go to a therapist. I, I just, I wish we all would because the, the people who are going to therapy, we tired of dealing with the people who ain't. Okay. I'm just saying y'all out here stressing us the f out. Okay. Sorry. I got a little focus rushing. Okay. Please go to therapy. Therapy when it comes to depression, no matter what modality works for you is amazing especially if you have no support system to talk about these things in the wild, okay, in real life. So if you really don't have nobody to talk to, go to a therapist. Also, a therapist is typically better than your friends that don't understand depression because your friends and your mommy and auntie Pookie and them, they're not going to know what to tell you. And if they tell you something nine times out of 10, it might be some unhealthy cultural coping mechanism that is backed up by no evidence of results and makes you feel worse. Okay. And we don't want that. Hey, Saran. Hi, boo boo. Long time no see. So therapy is best when in that therapy session, the trained professional is teaching you skills, right? So that you can use them to manage your depression. It's not as effective if you're just in there venting. If you're, I've had a therapist one time and I used to, she was like a amener. Okay? I was in there and we was kiki and every single time I said something to her in my life, she would amen everything I said. And I don't like that. Okay. Because I am not right about everything. I can't be in here. You got to challenge me. Okay. I'm out here getting bad results in my life and you in here acting like you my best friend. I had to get rid of her. Okay. <laughs> so make sure you get a therapist that can help you reality check and who can teach you new skills, okay? I'm gonna keep going before I move on. If you are a person that is having suicidal thoughts, if you are feeling stuck and hopeless, if you are in the bottom of the deepest trench, okay? And when I tell you, I, ooh, I felt my nervous system activate on that one because I understand. I know it don't look that way to y'all, but this is, I'm gonna tell y'all why it don't look that way because I'm so intentional, but I've been in the deep trench. Whew, I feel teary-eyed on that because I feel like somebody's going to watch this video and I'm like, girl, I spent a solid part of my 20s in the darkness. Y'all saw me coming up on these videos, smiling in y'all face. And when I tell you I was in the pit, okay? So I understand. Um, if you are in that place, please, please, please get professional help. Reach out to your primary care physician. Um, call the hotlines, Google the hotline numbers. I will put them in the information box or the comments of the video, depending on where you're watching. Please get help. It can get better. But let me tell you what. People always say, it gets better. It gets better with time. No, it don't. I'm not going to tell you that lie, okay? As Joan Rivers said, it gets better when you get better. Girl, if you don't do nothing, it's not going to get better. I'm not going to lie to you. People be telling you all these Instagram quotes and they don't realize you over here sinking. Okay? It don't get better unless you get better. Mm. So anyway. <laughs> all right. Let me talk to y'all about how I actually manage my depression. All right? Depression is an interesting experience because you can have two people in the same situation. One of them becomes depressed and the other one isn't. So that's why I was talking to you about how depression is such a like unique thing. Do not 
do not let anybody tell you you should not feel the way you feel. Your feelings are valid. I'm going to talk about using your feelings uh, incorrectly later or like taking your feelings too seriously later, but your feelings are valid. Okay. I always told my coaching clients that your feelings are like indicators on the dashboard of a car. They're not supposed to be driving the car, but they are supposed to show you that something needs to be addressed. Okay. So if you feel the way you feel, that's how you feel, boo boo. That's, that's it. And I'm here to tell you, that's just how you feel. So if everyone in your world is telling you that's not how you're supposed to feel, or they had the same thing happen to them and they didn't feel that way, that's just how life is. Okay. Some people like Brussels sprouts and some people don't. That, that's just how it works. Okay. We're all individual human beings. Studies show, and this is the good news studies actually show that you can learn skills and teach people skills to manage or overcome depression even starting in their life, which is amazing. It is also much more common that if you grew up with parents that are depressed, you will be depressed. And it's not only a biological thing. Actually, if depression runs in your family, each generation experiences depression worse. And studies show it's more, it's less because of biology and it's more because somebody can't teach you what they don't know how to do right? So if they've never modeled healthy coping skills, you didn't learn healthy coping skills. And now you out here double depressed. Okay. Grandma was depressed. Mama was double depressed. Now you triple depressed and you, you, you looking to end it all. Right. Let me help you. Okay. First thing I do, this is so important. The first thing I do to manage my depression, you guys, is I validate that my depression is valid. This took me years to learn. Girl, let me talk right in the camera. Girl, you might be sad because you are in a sad situation. Often people who are depressed are beating themselves up because they can't figure out why it seems like everybody else is doing well, but they are not. It seems like everybody else is happy in this experience, but they're not. It seems like, girl, the first thing that I did to help manage my depression, my persistent low mood, was I started to realize that I was in depressing situations. And that's why I was depressed. So, for example, I told you guys I did a lot of work to understand that dissociation was my my coping mechanism of choice. I was so dissociated that if you had asked me a few years ago if I had any trauma in my upbringing, I would have told you, no, it was amazing. It was great. It was beautiful. It was amazing. And it turns out that that was a dissociative coping me mechanism that I was using to not address the trauma that I experienced growing up. I was so traumatized that I had blocked it out of my brain. And I was only willing to look at the happy parts. And I magnified the happy parts. And I almost like ignored the not happy parts. Like I checked out entirely. And that was some deep work in therapy. Because do you know how disorienting that is to realize that like you are not looking at a situation holistically? And because of that, you are beating yourself up about not fitting into a broken situation when what you actually were in and or may actually be in right now is a broken situation. Another good example of that is, um, I told you guys, I, I participated in Exodus Summit, uh, online virtual summit this weekend. And I don't know if you know anything about it, but it's like a movement of Black women who want to you know, live outside of the US. They want to live in different countries and work as a digital nomad. They want to, you know, so it's a very free thinking group of women. Um, a lot of these women are learning that instead of beating themselves up for not being able to be happy in their job environment that they're in, maybe they're in a toxic job. Like, so that's the first thing. The first thing the first thing I started to do was I started to dismantle the idea that everything's fine and what's wrong with me? 
Maybe I am validly reacting to crappy situations. Maybe before my psychology even realized what was going on, my body and my soul had dragged me down, right? So that's the first thing. Start validating yourself. Um, I told you about someone who reached out to me recently and was like, aren't you the chick that talked about depression? Like how in the world? Because I'm depressed right now and I don't understand how you're doing what you're doing. And I listen, I get that from people all the time. And one of the things I offered to her was validation because she was describing a situation in her world. And I was like, I want you to look at it from this lens. You're describing a situation that is depressing. So you are not, nothing's wrong with you. You are having a valid reaction to the scenario that you're in. Therefore, that, that makes sense, right? So that's the first thing. Teaching myself to validate that I'm depressed and my depression is actually pointing out something to me. It's an indicator on the dashboard of life telling me, right, something needs to be addressed, right? When your check engine light comes on on your car, that tells you to check the engine. You should be like, when the depression light comes on on my life, that tells me to check my life. That's the first thing. Second thing is I stick to my routine. When in doubt, I stick to my routine. Okay, that's the second thing I do for my uh, to manage my depression. What does that mean, Rushni? I am very routine driven. Everyone is in this way, but I am. I, I just flourish in those spaces. Okay, I before I am depressed, I come up with some structure to the day that I would like it to have, and I'm very repetitive in how it goes. That's just how that works for me. It's worked for me for years. And when I get, especially now that I am a mom to a son with special needs, that's the other thing. People are like, girl, you told us you was depressed before you had your son. How in the world do you have a son with special needs and you still out here living your best pineapple life? Okay, let me see if I got some tissue. I feel like my nose is running. Oh, do I? Uh, yeah. So I stick to my routine, okay? Because I have noticed, especially when I'm depressed, that unstructured time leads to more depression. Uh, give me one second here. Let me turn you guys off so that I'm not um, blowing. Okay, she's back like she never left. So when I'm... I've noticed that when I'm depressed, when I feel the depression coming on, because real talk, you guys, I don't go into the deep pits anymore. The deep pits are, listen, your girl don't even have, I don't have time for the deep pits anymore. I used to go into the deep pits. I thought the deep pits were actually me. Back in the day, I didn't know that the depression wasn't me. I thought me and the depression were one and I was beating myself up. Now I am very square on the fact that me and the depression are not the same thing. And oftentimes I just tell a depression, I don't have time for you. And I do all of the things I'm about to share with y'all and I go about my business, okay? But back when, you know, back when I, I thought the depression and I were the same thing, I would just be in the deep pits thinking that I was in the deep pits, okay? Unstructured time for me means more depression, which means I already have a plan, okay? I already have a plan that I'm gonna do during my day so if my brain decides to go befuddled on me for some reason, or some unwayward thought starts floating through my brain, trying to drag me back into the abyss, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I'm going to go stick to my routine. I'm going to put my son on the bus. I'm going to get up and do my little twist out that I do, put on a little makeup if I feel like it. I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to clean the kitchen. I'm going to write. Um, if you've been on this platform with me, I don't know if you guys, anybody who's old school me has heard me say that when I got the news about my son in my 20 week ultrasound, that my son was going to be born with special needs if he lived at all. And I came home and I almost had a mental breakdown. Okay. I just, this voice in my head was like, you can either go into the abyss and never come out. Cause I, I literally saw this visual of me falling headfirst into an abyss. You have to imagine I'm 20 weeks pregnant with a depression diagnosis, they're telling me this stuff. They're telling me you need to terminate your pregnancy, like all that. 
And I'm sitting on the couch, literally rocking back and forth, not figuratively rocking back and forth and murmuring to myself, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, because I, I was about to lose it, okay? And the voice was like, you can either go head first into this abyss of darkness and you will never come out, or you can get up and clean the kitchen. I said, what not? <laughs> I'm trying to tell y'all that routine saved my sanity. I was like, come again. And the voice was like, you can go head first into an abyss of depression right now that you will not come out of. One that you've never experienced and one that you will never come out of. Or you could get up and clean the kitchen. So I got up and I cleaned the kitchen. And I did not go into a depressive abyss. So I stick to my routine. Other examples, I looked this up online, is have like a self-care box or like a depression box or something that you go to when you feel the inkling coming on. It can have a lot of your favorite things. Maybe it's like your favorite book. You know, maybe you watch your favorite movie. Maybe you um, have people write, people who love you and that you trust, write you notes of encouragement. Um, one of the things I have, I don't know if you can see it, right? Oh, where's my finger? Down here. There's a box right there. Every time people, like, you know, people mail me things, Glamazzini people, like I said, these were gifts. Um, family, friends give me cards, mementos, whatever. I put them in that box. And then around the holiday season, I go through the box. It's the best thing ever. It's, I mean, I just spend the whole holiday season just reading all of these beautiful notes and things people have sent to me over the years. It's amazing, okay? If you don't have stuff like that, ask people who you trust to write you stuff and put them in your little self-care box. And when you feel the little depression thing coming on, go to the box, okay? Maybe pictures of things that made you happy, um, things that feel good. You know, your favorite, I don't know, girl, put some soft socks in there, a list of things that make you happy, stacks that you like, or, you know, your favorite scent, right? So the second thing I do beyond validating that my depression is real and might actually be indicating that something's off and I need to address it is I, I, I go right to my routine, okay? Third thing, third thing I do to manage my depression is I check what I'm eating. I am highly affected by what I eat. If you followed me on YouTube over the years, you've experienced the trajectory of me being gluten-free. First of all, I'm very nat like natural bushy eater as it is. But then I went to like gluten-free and I noticed that my mood was elevated and I was like, wait a minute. And now I've been eating keto for years. There might actually be a video on my channel called did keto cure my depression or like keto cured my depression. I mean. Uh, cured, is, you know, you got to put the word cure for people to click on it. But um, when I started eating the ketogenic diet, which is low to no carbs, reduced to no carbs, protein, high healthy fats, okay, lots of veggies, I eat a lot of vegetables. Um, it in the span of three weeks, it was like somebody flipped my brain on. I remember telling my husband at the time, what's going on? Is this how everyone's brain is working? Which meant I had been walking around in a carb induced, carb and sugar, let's put that, induced brain fog for my entire adulthood and I did not know. That's me. I don't know what affects you. Everybody's body is different. So I'm not telling you specifically to eat keto. What I'm saying is when I started being depressed and I was going through the process of discovering the effects of food on my body, I learned by, by experimenting on myself that sugar and carbohydrates make me depressed, period. Sugar and carbohydrates make me depressed. They cause pain in my joints. They cause brain fog. Now imagine if you are eating sugar and carbohydrates all the time, you are in a consistent state of pain and brain fog. And you think that's you. And it's not until you experience life without it. Like I said, three weeks into the keto diet, I was like, what? what's happening? What's going on? So the next thing that I would tell anybody is check your diet remove or introduce things one at a time to see how your body responds. 
right? I don't, don't do a big switch because that's hard to maintain, okay? But let's just say, like, for example, I remember when I was starting keto, keto, I didn't just start keto. I had all my carbohydrates and I kept eating them. And I just decided, like, when I ran out of a thing, I would just stop eating it and see how that felt. So when I ran out of pasta, I just didn't buy any more pasta. And I just saw how that felt, you know? And then it went to like me needing a bunch of substitutes. And then eventually I went away from the substitute. But, you know, that was a progression. So check your food. Americans, mainland Americans are so far removed from how our food is grown, is um, processed. We we don't know. I'm from the Virgin Islands. I have a whole better understanding. I had to switch accents on y'all for that one. Did you hear that? My stomach is growling. If you can hear it, I'm so sorry. I'm from the Virgin Islands, so I have a better concept of where my food comes from. Okay, I grew up with all kinds of stuff growing in my yard, and I grew up where people would go fishing, and you would just clean the fish and eat the fish that afternoon, um, or go get a fish from the Mandonga Hill in the morning because he caught it this morning and it was alive when, like, in the pan when you bought it. Like, I am, with, I'm, I'm from the place where people still slaughter animals, and you're like near them. You could just go get some goat. Okay. So I'm not as far removed. I'm removed from it up here in the States. Okay. Food affects you. Especially if you're an American watching this. I mean, it seems like, it seems like common knowledge to me, but I'm going to say it. Food affects you. Oh, you know what I didn't say at the beginning of this? I want to say this. It's very important. I share this with everyone I help, including coaching clients. Never knock a simple solution you haven't tried. A lot of the things I'm about to tell you are simple solutions, not all, especially for somebody who is depressed, but do not knock a simple solution you haven't tried. Meaning if you know that drinking more water is good for you and it can help affect all kinds of stuff like your sleep, your digestion, your mood, your skin, your hair, your all of it, and you haven't figured out a way for you to drink more water, then you can't knock it because you haven't tried it. So you got to go ahead and try it. If you know that getting more sleep is important, right? Like that kind of thing. So that goes for all of this. Check your diet. The next thing is exactly what I said. Check your sleep. I'm not going to go in depth in this one because I think last week I did an entire video about how to get better sleep and dropped like 25 different tips about how to get better sleep. I am the queen of sleep proficiency. Okay. I wear this whoop on my arm and this whoop on my arm told me yesterday morning that my sleep proficiency is 92%. And I was like, I know whoop. I don't play. Okay. So I'm going to put a link to that video. Go back and watch the last video from last week, but check your sleep. Uh, a large, I think 90 something percent of our problems <laughs> that we perceive are some horrible thing that's hunting us down and some, you know, I'm being attacked by life could literally be solved by changing our food, our water and our rest and our environment. Like, Okay. The next thing that I do is, and I listen, I hate telling people who come to me for um, some information about depression this, but I have to because it's true. I hate it too. I move. I exercise. So the next thing I do to manage my depression is I move. Now, I know you want to lay in the bed wrapped up in the burrito. I know. But the best thing you could do is move. You know why? Because, well, there are lots of reasons why, but one of the minimal reasons is movement releases all kinds of feel-good hormones in your body. So even though I hate telling anyone who asks me what to do when they're depressed, that exercise and movement is a thing that they need to start doing, it just is, I'm, I'm sorry, girl. And I know you're depressed and you don't want to move. I know. But pitch yourself out that burrito, okay? Flop your little body out that burrito, okay? And if all you do is walk laps around your living room, if that's all you could do, okay? But you got to move. If you have a treadmill, jump on it. If you have a neighborhood, go walk in it. If you have a Zumba class, go to it. If you like to dance around your kitchen, do that. If you haven't been going to the gym, but you've been paying, go there. Like, do anything to move your body. Pull up something on YouTube, do some flow. It will help you try your best to have a consistent practice. Um, it helps. I, I, Like I said, I hate saying it. It helps. Okay. I was at the gym yesterday morning at eight in the morning. 
Do you think I wanted to be at the gym yesterday morning at eight in the morning? No, I did not. Okay. But I move my body as a prescriptive, um, like, uh, what do you call that? I move my body because it's healthy and all of those things, but it's like a, what do you call it? Preemptive. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a preemptive strike. So I don't get depressed. And then I came back from the gym and had the audacity to do a little 20 minute jaunt, walk around the neighborhood because the weather was so nice. Popped that podcast in my ear and got the trips and all over the place. Okay. Pulled up some of the houses that are for sale, um, wrote them down in my phone and then pull them up on Zillow. Stock them on Zillow when I got back home, like a normal person would. Okay. So move your body. And let me say this. If you are in the deepest depressed state and you just heard me say that, and you just like, now, girl, you must have never been depressed because I can't move. I understand. And I would say, do one thing. That's what I would say to you. If you are rolled up in the darkness of your room, your room is a junky mess and you are in the depression room, burrito, darkness, deep pit. The woe is me, what is the point pit? And you are listening to me. Get up. Take a shower. Get dressed. You don't even have to get cute dressed. Put on some fresh clothes. Just do something. And when you do that something, see how you feel. Make me that promise. You will get out of the burrito. You will go into the bathroom and take a shower. Brush your teeth and put on some clean clothes, okay? Now, next thing I do to help manage my depression is I use a light box or I get out in the sunshine. There's actually a light box sitting next to me. I reference it a lot on my videos, but I never have it on when I'm doing these videos because it shines in the glasses. When I come in my office in the morning, preemptively, preemptively, I turn that light box on and it stays on most of the morning into the early afternoon, every single day. I also do intentional sun exposure every morning. What that means is for five to 10 minutes every morning, as early as I can in the day, I go outside and I stand on my deck, sit or stand on my deck and let as much sunlight hit my skin and get into my eyes. Last week, when I was talking to you guys about sleep, I told you the benefits of intentional sun exposure on sleep. Intentional sun exposure also is very beneficial for elevating mood. So remember when I told you if you're in the deep darkness of the pit, if you're in the burrito and you get up and you shower and you dress, if you want to do one more extra thing, sis, like sis, if you want to do one more extra thing, go sit out in the sun. Open the garage door, sit, girl, sit on your driveway. You know that patio you don't use? Just go sit outside. Trust me, the way that our bodies are are created to work with the sun, getting sunlight, actual real sunlight from the sun is best into your eyes and on as much skin as possible. Now, don't go out there naked unless it's appropriate. I mean, you could get be naked, but don't, don't tell them. I didn't tell you to go out there both naked. But as much skin as uh, as possible does something to the chemicals in your body and it helps your sleep. Like I told you guys last week, it also helps elevate your mood, right? So that's a simple thing you could even do, right? All right, let me look. I'm looking at my notes. The next thing I do that I do intentionally to manage my mood is I pay attention to what may have triggered this specific depressive episode. Now, if you don't have a specific depressive episode because you're just pervasively depressed, I get it. Over time, if you start slowly incorporating all these things that I'm telling you, you won't be pervasively depressed. Uh, Listen, if somebody, you know what? If somebody had said that to me back then, I would have been like, they don't know what they're talking about. My depression is different. Listen, I'm trying to tell you what I know, okay? I thought the depression and I were the same thing and there was no differentiation and there was no hope. I'm telling you now at 47 years old with a major depressive disorder diagnosis twice, 
that if you start doing these things slowly over time, you won't be experiencing pervasive, consistent, always present, super low mood. You just, you won't, you won't, right? I already gave you so much information. I'm about to give you more. Okay. Right. So with that said, I pay attention to what's triggering the depression so I can prevent it in the future. Remember what I said to you guys, depression and all your feelings are indicators on the dashboard of your life. They are not you and they are not supposed to be driving the car. Your check engine light is not driving your car. You are. But your check engine light tells you to check the engine. Depression and all your other feelings should not be driving your life. You should be. However, your depression is signaling to you. Remember I told you earlier that something's going on. All right. What I say up here, something biological is off. Did you sleep off? Did you eat something crazy? Right. I'm going to tell you all right now, when I go on vacation, I eat whatever I want to. I take my digestive enzymes and I'm like YOLO. Okay. I'm ready to risk it all for, for this burger and this sushi. I also know that if I eat a big, you know, thing of ice cream full of carbohydrates and sugar, I'm probably going to have low mood. I'm going to be sad and my joints are going to be hurting, right? I understand the correlation of those things to in my own body to the point that I no longer think what's wrong with me. I think, oh, I ate a burger. <laughs> oh, I ate pizza, right? What triggered it? People who are depressed aren't always attuned with the fact that it's not them and that the depression is just signaling to you that something biological is happening, something psychological happened, right? Maybe you were triggered by a trauma that's unaddressed. Something social happened. One of your triggering family members called you or said some stupid thing in your face and you ain't ever, right? Like you want to bust them in the face, but instead you go and you implode. <laughs> Listen, that's facts. Okay. So pay attention to what triggered it, because then you're going to use that information to. Remember, I told you about a routine and ways to to create an escape when you're feeling good so that, you know, when you're when you start to feel down what to do. Right. So like back in the day, food used to be taking me off on a cliff. Nowadays, I choose if I'm going to feel bad. I choose if I'm going to feel bad when it comes to food. Food doesn't have that effect in me, on me anymore because I am clear about how my food affects my low mood. I'm clear about it in a way that I wasn't before. The other thing that I do, let's talk about food, is if I am depressed or if I am um, in danger, quote unquote, of feeling depressed, I do not drink alcohol. Um, I do not recommend that you drink alcohol. When they study the human brain and body, Alcohol triggers the same neurological stuff, biological stuff as depression, you guys. So unfortunately, a lot of times people who are depressed will drink alcohol as a way of escape. But alcohol is like drinking depression juice. I'm not saying alcohol is like drink, drinking depression juice for people who are not depressed. Alcohol has lots of, and nicotine have lots of different effects on different people's bodies. But if you are a person who is experiencing depression, I highly recommend you don't drink alcohol. That's one of the things that I do. If I'm feeling low, alcohol got to go. Because ain't no sense in the depression juice. And then being like, why Why I want to jump off this cliff now? Well, you want to jump off the cliff because you, just, you had all these carbohydrates and sugar and, and you're drinking on the stuff, right? Do not. Okay. So that's one of the things that I do. I cut off, I'll drink. Now, I'm not a person that drinks that often, but like, I'm not going to feel sad and go drink a glass of red wine thinking that it's going to un help me unwind and then wake up the next morning feeling even sadder, having my neck, my back, my, keep it together, Rushni, and my knees hurt. I was about to say it, but I said, ooh, mm. <laughs> focus, Rushni, everything hurting. And then be like, woohoo, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me is I drank alcohol and didn't know that it, it tanked my mood because of inflammation. Okay. And maybe you would know that too. Yes. Yeah, Saran is here. Saran is a doctor and Saran is sharing with us that alcohol is a depressant. Okay. So if you are a person who lives with depression, drink your alcohol if you want to, but when you are depressed, alcohol is like drinking depression juice. Okay. 
the next thing that I do when I am depressed to manage my depression is I seek support and I stay connected. Girl, shut up. I don't want to see nobody. I know. That's the point. Okay. Depression makes you isolate because depression tells you something wrong with you and you don't want to see nobody and nobody want to see you. Okay. If you're a perfectionist depression person like myself, you feel so low. You don't want anybody to be around you because you don't want to be a burden. You don't want to be a saddie, 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 saddie. Okay. You only want them to see you when you're a baddie. Okay. But, but, when you are living this thing called life, I highly recommend that you create intentional connections with people who know the entirety of you, the whole you, including the fact that you out here living your best life as a fatty sometimes, okay? My best friends, the people who love me, God has blessed me. Mm, I just thought about my people. <laughs> Okay, sorry. I got excited. God has blessed me with some really incredible humans, Black women especially, who know me and have yet to, to drag me for filth, no matter which part of me I reveal to them. Okay? And they know when I'm low. And I got a couple solids, probably like three I could think of out the gate. No, Listen, names are flying in that I can say to them, the low stuff is starting. Say something. And when I tell you they don't ask no questions, they boom, bop, 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 bop. So, oh, I'm hitting my mic. You guys, I'm not used to having a mic. So just bear with me. Okay. If I start feeling the depression, one of the things that I do to manage the depression is I reach out to my pre-created support system, which means sadie in the burrito. You have to be vulnerable enough to share with people who are worthy of your trust, not just everybody. Don't, don't, that everybody ain't worthy. We're going to get to that in a second. Okay. Cause that's part of what I do. Everybody's not worthy of your trust, but find the people or create. If you don't have them right now, reach out to people, find incredible communities. I have a coaching group on Facebook. Let me find my banners. I have a coaching group on Facebook. It's called Find Your Light. It is free. Okay. Bit.ly slash Lamazini Find Your Light. It is a group of 800 plus black women. Okay. And we are a safe place. You might find your person in there. And if not, we might just be the support system that you need. There are other communities. Exodus Summit is an amazing one. Thousands of freedom minded black women who are not going to think that you are crazy and blah, 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 blah. They're not. They're not going to think it, okay? And if neither of those communities work for you, find the community. It's so much easier online. I said I said earlier sometimes that technology can make us feel less connected. But, you know, you can take it something that started online and take it offline and make it a real-life connection and use that support system because we are not designed to do this by ourselves. We're not. So the next thing that I do is I create intentionally the support system that I need, and then I access that support system when I need it. And let me add this. Don't just ask people to do for you and not be willing to do for them, right? It's a reciprocal support system. Just keep that in mind, okay? The next thing I do is to manage my depression is I intentionally do something expressive or fun. Expressive or fun, right? So let's think about this. I think that expression is the opposite of depression. I decided that many years ago and I'm sticking to it, okay? If you look at the definition of depress, just the word depress, it means to shrink down, to lessen, right? To depress. Express is like you squeeze something, you expand it, you expand it out. When I realized that depression meant that several years ago, I started thinking, okay, so does that mean that I'm bridled? Does that mean that I'm shrinking? 
does that mean that I feel like I'm not able to speak up in certain situations? Which goes back to the first point I told you guys about validating the fact that you might be in a crappy situation. Okay, so you out here beating yourself up when what's really happening is you feel like you can't speak up. You're in a toxic situation, you're a toxic job, a toxic relationship, a horrible, right? Like your living situation is anxiety causing, trauma causing. Like, okay, so one of the things that I've started doing and it has helped immensely is intentionally doing something to express myself. What, Rushni? What do you do to express yourself? Well, guess what? You are experiencing it right now. If you know who I am and we have never met a day in our lives, it's because I love a camera. And it's not necessarily I love a camera. I like to take pictures. Although your girl is, listen, I can pose. I need to get back to the glam part of Glamazzini because I really haven't been out here, you know, throwing it on y'all like I really need to. But when I tell you I can pose in a picture. But you turn on a video camera in front of me and I'm going to talk. Okay. One thing about me is <laughs> I'm going to talk. Okay. I'm going to talk on Facebook. I'm going to I'm gonna express myself on YouTube. I'm going to express myself on Patreon. I'm going to express myself public, unlisted, and private videos. Okay. I'm going to listen. I love a good video. This is one of my favorite forms of expression. It is. Other forms of expression that you can try are journaling. I write in a journal every single day. I write affirmations out. I also write in my journal. I have three feelings wheels. If you've never heard that before, I'll, I'll put a link to it in the comment section. Um, feelings wheels printed out on my wall. I will grab a feeling that I'm feeling to help me express myself even more in my journal. I record private video diaries. Why? Because I just told you guys I like a camera. And a black female therapist that I was working with through the pandemic. Um, recommended to me that maybe I could use the medium of video because I like it so much. So I record private video diaries. Um, if you like to paint, get up and paint. If you like to draw, draw something. If you like coloring books, color something. I wrote down here, make a collage, take some pictures, girl, take a walk, um, take pictures of the birds, the leaves. I don't know. Sing, make some music, make up a song, dance around your kitchen, join a dance class, write something knit, embroider, girl, cook, bake, like whatever expresses what's going on inside of you. Okay. I remember when Tony Daly, she is my friend, even though I've technically never met her in real life, but like, she's my sister at this point. Okay. She's one of these parasocial relationships that I, whatever. I love her so much. Unfortunately, a few years ago, she went through a very traumatic experience where her husband abandoned her. Okay. And it was a tumultuous divorce situation. And she was sharing this on her YouTube channel. And I guess there were some people who were like, why would you share that? Da, 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 da. And I'll never forget this. Tony said that musicians make music and singers sing and dancers dance and vloggers vlog. And so she was letting those people know that vlogging was her chosen way of expression. And I highly recommend to anyone dealing with depression that maybe what you are dealing with is feeling depressed. And the antidote to that is to express. Me and this microphone are not having the best. Okay. To express. Yeah. So find something that helps you express it. Whether you share that something with someone or not. Nah. Saran said she likes to create in Canva. I love me some Canva. Okay. And I have the Canva premium account. If you don't know what we're talking about, just go to canva.com and start playing. But you don't need a premium, premium account. Okay. The free account will get you where you need to go. And this is from somebody who is very skilled in Photoshop. I love Photoshop and I've been using Photoshop since 1993. Once again, let's stop and have a moment for the, do the math. I've been using Photoshop since version two, okay? Canva is a beautiful digital way to express yourself. Okay, I'm clearly over an hour, but I'm gonna keep going because I feel like this video is going to be the reference that the black girlies need. Okay. Saddies, I got you.
I'm telling you what I have done. I'm telling you the answer to the question that people hit me with all the time where they're just like, rush me, I don't understand. How in the world can you have a double, now a double major depressive disorder diagnosis? And, and I also have a PTSD diagnosis, okay? As I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, I got diagnoses. And I started laughing so hard because I was like, me too. Okay, it's alphabet soup over here. I'm telling you what I know works for me and for all the women that I have coached, like professionally or just helped in the background, people who have reached out to me over the years. These things have worked. Okay, next thing. This is where we're going to go into how I change my mind. The battlefield for the depressed girlies is in the mind. Everything I'm about to say to you guys, I'm saying knowing what you feel. If I hit a nerve, it's not because I want to hit your nerve, but it's because I want to kind of just gently nudge you. I want to gently nudge you into a space where you can get out of the abyss, that dark place that you're in. This is how you do it, girl. I don't know if mental health professionals are going to tell you all of this. They might. Nowadays, there's so many resources on the internet and people are saying a lot more of these preventative tools and tips. But oftentimes you can go to a doctor and a doctor can just be like, you're depressed, take this medication. And you're like, now I'm depressed and I have no emotion. And now the medication is doing something weird to me, but I still don't feel better. And I'm still stuck, right? So the battlefield's in your mind. So I think I think everything else I have, yeah, most of everything else I have is going to be about mind shifts, you guys. Mind shifts, right? First thing, I reality check. This is very hard when you're a depressed girl, when you're a sadie, okay? Because you believe out the gate that the depression and you are one. I believed out the gate that me and my depression were the same thing. There was no differentiation. It took intentional work for me to separate that Rushni was one entity and the depression was a description of my mood disorder. In the past, when I was coaching, I did a lot of work with my coaching clients about learning how to observe their own thoughts. We as human beings are one of the unique creations where we get to think about our thoughts. We can think about our thought, right? How do I know this? If I tell you to meditate right now and you sit down and you try to meditate, especially if you have no experience with meditation, what's possibly going to happen is you're going to sit there and do what you think you're supposed to do, which is close your eyes and try to become still. And you think you're not supposed to think anything, right? So when a thought comes in your mind and you're, you think, wait, did I add that scrub daddy to the grocery list? Am I supposed to be doing her hair on Sunday? When all those thoughts start coming in, the next thing that's going to happen when you catch yourself is you're going to start beating yourself up about thinking your thought, which means you can observe your thought from the outside, okay? Fun fact, just, as, just so you know, meditation is not about emptying your mind. Meditation is practiced peace. Meditation is about learning what to do with the thoughts when they come into your head and learning how to, I, I visually think of it as like sliding the thought out of the way and practicing my peace so that I can reference it later when I need it in real life. But that's not what this video is about. Okay, right? So I start reality checking. How do I reality check? First reality check is, the depression and I are not the same, okay? Second reality check is if depression, if this strange lady with pineapples in her ears and rainbows on her shirt on the internet told me that depression is an indicator on the dashboard of my life, if the depression light is coming on, what is it trying to tell me? Yeah? Let's say the depression is like telling you what's the point. None of this matters. Okay. That's a common one. None of this matters. What's the point? You're having some like global existential crisis, which we're going to get into. Okay. Is that fact or is that feeling? 
I started asking myself that. Now, this is one of the things you can learn in therapy. I know therapists work on this. I'm not a therapist. I'm just telling you. If you hear a voice in your head on the indicator of the dashboard of your life telling you none of this matters, is that real? Because th this stuff matters. I'm not sitting here sharing this information with you on the internet because it doesn't matter. I'm sitting here sharing this information with you on the internet because I am going to help a Black woman learn how to live, thrive, and manage her depression. She is going to learn to surf and flow through life in a way that she has never experienced before because of what I'm doing right now. It matters. Um, I am a mom to a son with special needs and what I do for him matters. So I reality check. If, if the indicator is telling me a lie, then I tell myself, girl, that's a lie. Okay. And now I can do something about it. Okay. Next thing. <clears throat> We're doing the the thinking, how I rewired my mind. And let me tell y'all something. The good news about neuroplasticity, what is that rushing? That's a big word. What that means is back in the day, they used to think that you couldn't teach an old dog new tricks, but that's not true. People's brains are forever learning and can always be rewired, right? Yes, our brains become more rigid because neurons that fire together, wire together, which means we associate certain things with certain traumas. But if you are intentional, you can actually over time rewire your brain. I'm not saying this is some chick on the internet. I'm saying that's what the smart neurological humans say, the researchers, the professors, the doctors. So if you do what I'm telling you over time, you can re rewire your brain. And I think that's what I've done, you guys, without even realizing that that's what I was doing. I think I've rewired my brain, okay? So this is what I'm talking to you guys about thought work. The next thing I ask myself is, okay, let me, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of attributional style, right? The most socially understood concept is, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? What's an optimist? An optimist is a person that tends to see things in a hopeful manner. A pessimist is a person that tends to see things in a, in a dry, non-hopeful manner, right? Optimists think the glass is half full. Pessimists think the glass is half empty, yada, yada, yada. What is that? That is an example of your attributional style. What does that mean? It means how you look at the world, okay? So what have I done to manage my depression? I have changed my attributional style. I just told you guys. I think I inadvertently rewired my brain without knowing I was doing it. Now, this is something I'm gonna try not to go too deep. I talked about this in coaching years ago. I'm going to try not to go too deep, but I start asking myself these questions. At first, it's going to be hard, saddy girl, because if you're depressed, I promise you, your attributional style is contributing to your depression. It's the lens through which you look at your life. So if you're depressed, you're starting at the lowest and most depressive attributional styles. OK, but I want you to know this is a teachable, learnable and changeable thing over time. It's not you. Remember what I said. You and the depression are not the same thing. OK, so now you got to start looking at this depression. You here look at the depression and ask this depression some questions. OK, I was about to cuss because this depression messing up your life. OK, we got stuff to do depression. Like what? what's good? OK, that's how I started looking at stuff. I started asking the depression some questions. OK, so the first thing I want you to ask yourself is. How permanent do you tend to perceive situations? The two answers are stable, meaning this is unchanging, or unstable, meaning this can change, right? If you know anything about fixed and growth, mind, growth mindsets, this is in that space, right? People who are depressed, people who are prone toward depression tend to look at life as permanent and unchangeable. I have a bad temper. That is what it is. Nothing is different. To manage your depression, you need to start challenging that and shifting from the idea that you are stuck in some predestined abyss and start understanding the truth, the fact, remember I said reality check, that a growth mindset which is 
I have had a bad temper in the past, but I can do something about that is going to lead to one, you learning how to manage your temper and two, you being less depressed. Think about it. If you felt like you were stuck in something and you had no ability or control to change your environment, you would be depressed too. A few years ago, I came up with my own definition of the word joy. To me, joy is the knowing or the confidence that you have agency to change your life. Stephanie Perry on YouTube says, we have options, we have choices. When you start realizing that this is not permanent, no matter what it is, and I know that there's somebody who's going to hear this and say, yes, it is, girl, I can't change it. Listen, I had the same thoughts. I'm trying to tell you what I know, okay? And I promise you're not my age. I'm 47. Whoever you are, you're probably younger than me. I'm trying to tell you something, okay? I thought things were permanent too. Now, are they sometimes harder to change the longer you've lived them? Yes. Yes. But everything, if you woke up this morning, like Alicia Renee says on YouTube, if you woke up this morning alive, then live. Every single day, you get the opportunity. So if you tend to think things are permanent, you're going to be more depressed. You're also going to catastrophize more, right? We all know these people that are like chaos, catastrophe. They run off into stories, right? If you're a saddie, you're running off into a I'm stuck story. And I told you the reality check. I believe that we live in the stories that we tell ourselves. Okay. I believe that we live in the stories that we tell ourselves. Psychology calls it a narrative. The Bible calls it a testimony. I just call it, listen, whatever delusion you want to live in, you tell yourself that and you go be her. D decide who you want to be and be her. You can create who you are. This weekend on Exodus Summit, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, who is the founder of Therapy for Black Girls, she called it possibility modeling, right? If you've never seen it, you think it's impossible. If you have a permanent attributional style and you think nothing, everything is stuck and you're just stuck, you're going to be stuck because you live in the story you tell yourself. So start considering what if you start telling yourself a different story. And I highly recommend getting into community with women who are telling you the other stories. Don't start trying to tell yourself another story going back to the people who depressed you. Like, no offense, but like, if your mommy and your husband and your cousins and Pookie are the people who caused you to be socially, are the social factors that called you to cause you to be depressed and they have a fixed mindset. And then you go to them and you try to tell them your new expansive expressional thought processes. And they're like, nah, girl, that's not true. Of course they think it's not true. Girl, find the, find the expansive minded human. Don't listen to the people that put you in the situation that you're in. That's just, okay. The next thing about attributional style, how pervasive do you perceive situations, right? A person who thinks globally tends to be more depressed than a person who thinks locally. Let me explain. Global thinking is overgeneralizing. So let's say you have a bad experience in a relationship with someone of the opposite sex and you're a woman. And instead of saying he sucks, you start to say men suck. And I told you, you can live in the story that you tell yourself. Because if you're walking around saying that men suck, well, then booby, you know what you're going to end up having? Depressing, horrible experiences with men. Okay. Um, <laughs> and same thing with your depression. If you are walking around out here and you have a, let's say a bad experience, you, uh, let's say this, you text a friend and they never text you back. You're always the one initiating. If you have a global thought process, you're more likely to say, they don't like me. Maybe they don't want to be my friend. You, you just start overgeneralizing. Nobody wants to be my friend. Why can't I make friends? When all that happened is this person is grown and busy. <laughs> Okay. This person is grown and busy, right? So if you tend to have a global way of perceiving the world and attributing how things happen to you, you are going to be more depressed, period. What does that mean, Rashni? I started asking myself, is this some global sweeping truth or is this just a specific thing that's happening to me in the moment? Right? 
Maybe it's not that this person doesn't like you. I mean, maybe they don't. I don't know. Who, who knows? But just because they didn't text you back that night doesn't mean anything. You, you got unrealistic expectations. Like people grown and busy out here. All right. We're not in our, or maybe you in your 20s. Boo, boo, boo. If you're in your 20s and your teens, let me tell you something. Life be life in. Okay. Everybody can't have you as the first priority in their life. I made a video about that one time and I got a little bit of pushback, but I'm just trying to say it's only 24 hours in a day. I got to sleep eight of them jokers. So, okay. So, and I got a kid with special needs and I got all this other stuff going on in my life. Sometimes I'm going to text you back in a couple, three days. Like, like you don't have, the world is not ending. Okay. So localize, ask questions, ask yourself questions. That's what I would say. I started asking myself, Rashni, is this, they don't love me. Uh, or is this, maybe they're busy. Maybe they um, had something to do. Maybe they need me to check on them. Right localize your thinking, localize your thinking. Next thing I ask myself is, well, let me go back to this. The other thing about how pervasive and global you think the problem is, is people who are depressed, me included, this is something that I've really learned. This was life-changing, okay? This was life-changing. People who are depressed, like I said, we tend to be more global thinkers. So we don't tend to be very good at problem solving because you need to be a specific localized thinker to be an efficient problem solver, right? I watched a video one time and the guy gave this example. He works with people who are depressed and he said he would ask his depressed patients, tell me how to take a shower. And the depressed patients would say something like, you wet yourself, you lather up, and you rinse off the lather. I mean, yes, and there are so many, and, and the assignment was, tell me how to do it in a way that somebody who's never done it, like an alien needs to know how to do it, right? Consistently depressed people have such a short list of specific tasks on how to solve problems. Do you know what that turns into, you guys? You're not solving your problems. This was me. Because you're not thinking about the specific small tasks that need to happen next. They're not even coming to your mind. So you think you're stuck because you don't realize that the answer of how to take a shower is, I'm, listen, I could go so granular. I could give you 75 steps right now on how to take a shower, right? But let's just assume that you have all the things you need and you're in the bathroom already, right? You're going to remove your clothes. You got to open up the buttons on your shirt. You got to take the, you know, you got to take your shirt off. You have to remove your bra by unhooking the this. You need to, right, remove your pants by unhooking the buttons and unhooking the zip, like all of that. You need to da, 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 step into the shower. You need to bend down. You need to look at the, the faucets to see which ones indicate that it's a hot water and which ones indicate that it's the cold water. You need to turn the water on and then you need to find the temperature. Like, like it's a million steps. Problem solving in your life requires that level of thinking and saddies like myself, we have a tendency to be so global in our thinking that we are thrashing ourselves for not being able to move into a different solution in our lives when the issue that we're experiencing, okay, brace yourself. I'm about to say something that depressed people don't like to hear is a self-imposed, I love you. I'm saying this because I love you. It's a self-imposed experience that can be solved if we thought more granularly, okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? That's why I'm saying if you're in the burrito in the deepest, deepest, darkest place in your bed, or if you're functionally depressed and you're at work in a haze going through the motions, Maybe you need to think about granular steps to move you out of that valid depressed space. You're not stuck. You're just not availed to granular steps. Like, for example, let's go with the functional depressed girl. You're sitting at a job you hate. You go every day. You complain. You cry in the parking lot. That was me. You cry in the parking lot every morning before you go into this job. Okay. But you're still going. You think you have no choice. You think society, like you, there's no out, right? 
first of all, go to Exodus Summit. That's going to help you get free. Okay. There's a lot of black women out here who have removed themselves from the matrix, but that's not, that's not my ministry. That's theirs. But what I'm saying is you can get out of that because you have a global thought process. You're not thinking about the steps that you need to get out of it, right? You're either not thinking about them yourself. So you feel stuck or you're not availing yourself to already established spaces that can give you the information. Like they already know it. They already know it. Okay. So that's the other thing about changing your mind. Am I thinking too globally? Train yourself to think more granularly. The way that this showed up in my life was I felt like I was stuck because I just couldn't see ways out of things. And so there were so many things that I was just stuck in, not realizing, Rushni, you, 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 can, you can ask for help. You can look for resources online. You can learn this. You can figure it out for yourself, or you can use somebody else's pre-made model to remove yourself from the job you don't want to work, the, like all of these things, you know what I mean? About my life or my body or my business or my anything, right? Okay, let me keep moving because I'm, all right, I'm, I'm moving. Davi, you said you're taking notes. Absolutely take notes. Save this video. Share this video. Oh, you know, I never asked you guys to thumbs up the videos, but if you could like the video, if you're watching it, wherever you're watching it, I think that that helps the algorithm. That'd be awesome, right? Yeah, definitely save this video because I'm hoping that it'll be a resource. OK, the next thing about changing your mind that will help you with the, your depression is how personal do you perceive the situation? Now, listen, this is going to be the one that's going to touch the saddies hearts. I'm so sorry, you guys. It, listen, it's either an ouchie or an amen. There are some people who I'm not saying this. I'm just telling you this so you could hear it. OK, there are some people who believe that depression is one of the most narcissistic mood sp spaces you could be in. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect you, but I'm just telling you, okay? How personal are you perceiving the situation? I didn't say how personal is the situation. How personal are you perceiving the situation? Do you have a tendency to think everything is about you? Mm, I'm, listen, I'm trying to say it kindly because I know back in the day, I would have boxed, when I was depressed in the deepest pits, I would have boxed somebody in the face trying to tell me this because I'm already down on myself. And now you're trying to tell me I'm narcissist. <laughs> but I'm not, listen, what I'm saying is you're too, you're overly internally focused. So one of the things I had to do was teach myself to stop being so internally focused. Stop being so, maybe they don't like me and what's wrong with me. and. I don't have a point and I can't figure it out. And I, 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 and I, 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 and I, 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 right? So like I said, I'm not saying this to be mean. This is with all the loving kindness that I can offer. Depression tends to ex be exacerbated in spaces where the person perceives situations to be more personal. This person's out to get me. The job is doing something to me. My mom owes me something. You see what I'm saying? Those things are not truth. Remember I asked you, I told you, I taught myself to reality check. Those things are the lens through which you naturally see the world and or are choosing to see the world. And I say that delicately because it's not a choice at the beginning because you think the depression and you are the same. But over time, you start to realize that it's a choice. And let me tell you what, uh, there was a YouTuber years ago that said depression was a choice and I unfollowed her. I was like, she tripping. And <laughs> now I'm out here saying something similar. Listen, I was like, she tripping. She don't understand. She don't understand. What I'm saying is when you start in this journey of managing your depression, it's not a choice because it's literally you and the depression, you think they're the same thing. Over time, when you start doing these things, I'm telling you, you start to realize you and the depression are not the same thing. And you get to choose whether you're interacting with this thing. And one of the things you're choosing to interact with is a lens that says this specific trauma thing that happened to me was personal. They did it intentionally. 
they did it to me. The job's out to get me. This person made me, me. My mama made me, me. My cousin made me, me. Okay? So those were some of the huge, I'm talking about these were some of the hugest shifts that I unintentionally rewired my brain. Okay? I had to learn that it wasn't permanent. It wasn't pervasive. I have to think more locally, more specific in my problem solving and everything in about me. Okay. And that over time has helped to improve the lens through which I keep saying that the lens through which I experience things. Um, for many years, I'd be like, I got a kid in a wheelchair. Like people would be trying to listen. I am a content creator on on Tabitha Brown's internet, okay? People be wiling out in these comment sections. They just feel like they could talk to you any old kind of way. And the reason why they feel like that is because they don't realize that I'm six foot one and don't let these pineapples fool you, okay? I am from the Virgin Islands and I'll go clear off, okay? I've told my coaching clients before, I got a spicy island woman pineapple mouth. So they just be talking to me crazy in the comment section. And the way that the joy of the Lord is my strength. I usually ignore and or I use them as a joke in, in like a post. And part of that is because of the lens through which I look at stuff. Like most of the people who are in my comment section saying negative things to me can't do what I do. They won't do what I do. Mm -hmm. They are in the stands yelling at me. I'm on the field, as Brene Brown says. And I think Roosevelt says, daring greatly. They in the stands yelling at me about something they can't do. Okay. So that's how I have changed my lens. Let me keep going. This is a long one, but I'm going to let it be long. I can't stay forever though. Cause I got to get my kid off the bus. Okay. But I'm gonna let it be long because I feel like this is a resource that a lot of the girls, a lot of the saddies need. Next thing that I did was I started asking myself, am I generating unnecessary stress? What do you mean by that, Rushni? When you're depressed, you have a tendency to tell yourself a very self-defeating um, story where you are the victim in your narrative, right? I was telling myself a self-defeating story where I was the victim, the helpless, stuck victim in my narrative, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. I couldn't do anything about it. And from that lens, I was generating unnecessary stress in my life. Yes. So for example, for example, if I know that eating poorly makes me feel a certain kind of way, but I still get up and I eat poorly because I'm making negative decisions, I'm generating unnecessary stress in my body and in my mind. Because when I eat poorly, then what's going to happen? Every depressed person knows what happened. Remember I told you we can think about our thoughts. So not only am I going to feel bad because I ate the food and it literally made me feel bad, I'm going to feel bad about the fact that I felt bad. <laughs> so now I'm double depressed. And like, no, no offense, but whose fault is that? It's mine. It's mine. I'm adding stressful scenarios that I know. That's why the discovery process is so important because over time you start to know what is triggering to your depression. So now I had to start asking myself, Rushni, why are you doing this thing that you know depresses you? Here's another example. You know you got that family member every single time you see their name on the caller ID. Do we still call it a caller ID? I'm gonna call it caller ID because I'm old. I could do what I want to, okay? Every time you see that person name on the caller ID, your nervous system goes crazy. You don't want to talk to them. You don't want to talk to them. That person is unhealthy. They're traumatizing. They speak to you all kind of funny way out their mouth. And you want to pop them in their face. But for some reason, you keep picking up the phone. And you pick up the phone before you have to go on a Zoom call with your boss. Why? No, no. Technology allows you to say no. People have too much access to us nowadays anyway. Okay. If you know that you're generating unnecessary stress by continually not having a boundary with a stressful and or depressed induced depression inducing family member and or friend or human, then don't interact with them or only interact with them when you have the mental bandwidth. One of my favorite things to do is mute people online. Sometimes I don't want to fully get rid of you, but sometimes you're talking crazy out the side of your face and I just don't want it. So you just, 
I am very big on, you know, so am I generating unnecessary stress? Um, there's going to be a faction of people who tell you you shouldn't have to be able to do this. I saw this on Twitter recently where people were saying like, you shouldn't be able to mute people because that's like suppressing free speech. I wish. Listen, the block is still hot on these internet streets. Okay. Come in here talking crazy and see if even, I might not do it during the live, but see if after this live, I don't shut you, I don't block. The block still works. Mm. The block still works. Listen, I don't expose myself to unnecessarily stressful situations as some sort of like struggle Olympics gold medal. And I'm telling you this as a person who's near 50. If you are young and you're watching this and you have people telling you that you should just be exposing yourself to stressful jobs, stressful relationships, stressful humans, depressing situations, depressing choices, yada, 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 they're wrong. They're wrong. I'm telling you right now, they're wrong. Don't spend too much more time around those people. Find a different group of people who are giving you um, songs of freedom, lessons of freedom, and stop exposing yourself to unnecessary stressful situations because of your poor decision making and lack of boundaries. God bless it. Okay, move on, Rashni. The next thing I had to re listen, this was one. This, listen, I keep saying that they're all important, but this was one right here. I had to ask myself, Rushni, are you ruminating? What's ruminating, Rushni? Ruminating is repeating and analyzing thoughts over and 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 over. And listen, if you are if you are a saddie, I'm gonna call you a saddie. Okay. If you're a depression saddie, you know that's our favorite thing to do. Listen, in the darkness, in your room, wrapped up in a burrito, have you showered recently? We don't know. Okay. And you in there thinking about all the things you dipping in and out of sleep, thinking about things from 1996. What you should have said to this person and how this person mistreated you and just do, 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 do. stop, halt. Okay. Halt, halt. I had to teach myself when I learned me and the depression were not the same thing. Okay. The depression and I were not one. And I started interacting with the depression as though it was an entirely separate entity for me. I realized that the anecdote to ruminating and spinning repeated thoughts in my head, analyzing them into a fine dust and usually coming up with the, usually coming up with the very personally focused it's all about me. Something is wrong. Conclusion. I said it. Okay. The antidote is action. Not the bag of mode, as Tara Fabulous says. Okay. Action. You have to do something different. I know you're like, but I don't want to do anything. I told you earlier, are you generating unnecessary stress and are you making bad decisions? Sadie, you have to do something before you feel the thing often. You're waiting to feel some kind of way before you do it. You're never going to feel that way until you do it. Okay. You're not going to feel that way, especially if your natural mood is lowered by social, psychological, or biological factors. Your floor is lower than most. You're not going to feel that way. You're, it's not going to get better. I told you that earlier. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. You have to get better. So the way that you cure rumination and repeatedly spinning on thoughts. And listen, this is for the depressies and the, the saddies and people who just are, you know, out here feeling a little low during the day. If you're spinning a thought in your mind, the off ramp is to do something. Do something to change that, even if it's a small thing. Example. Somebody called you talking crazy to you out the side of their mouth. And they always call you talking crazy to you out the side of the mouth. Now you're stressed out. You want to go get a glass of wine and you're boohooing because they made you feel like crap, but you couldn't speak up to them on the phone because they're an elder and you're not supposed, you're supposed to respect your elder. But every single time they try to access you, you pick up the phone. The first thing that I want you to do is I want you to sit down and take a woosah, do something to regulate your um, nervous system, something that makes you feel better, something that makes you feel good. The other thing I want you to do is intentionally set up a boundary. Tell yourself boundaries are not 
for other people. Boundaries are for you. Boundaries, the best definition I've ever heard of boundaries is what you will do and what you won't do, boo-boo. What you will do and what you won't do. Not will, not what they will do and what they won't do, okay? So you set up an internal boundary. You might want to journal this. You write down to yourself, I do not feel good when so-and-so pookie calls me. They talk to me crazy outside of their mouth. I don't even know how to respond to them in a healthy way. But what I will not do is I will no longer pick up the phone when Pookie calls me during the day, I will only pick or, you know, afternoon, I will only speak to Pookie on Saturday mornings. Maybe you don't speak to Pookie at all. Okay. And then you enforce that boundary with yourself. That way you don't have to be sitting there spinning in your mind about how Pookie talked to you and Pookie talked to you crazy and other da, 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 and literally choosing an experience that now propels you into your natural pit of depression. You see what I'm saying? And listen, if this sounds this sounds off to you, you don't know what I'm talking about. But there are people who know exactly what I'm talking about. You're hurling yourself into this pit and I'm trying to tell you how to not go into it. So the anecdote to my ruminating thoughts was I had to change, I had to do something. Rushni, do something. Now, remember what I told you is when you think that your situation is unchangeable, you tend not to do anything. So that was why I was like, you got to really dig into where you're coming from in your mind. Because nothing is permanent. Nothing actually is. That's a big existential statement. Okay. But it's, it's, it, nothing is. Okay. The next thing that I asked, my, oh, and you know what else? I wanted to say this about creating possibilities and possibility modeling too, because like I said, this weekend I was on Exodus Summit. And Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, who is the um, founder of Therapy for Black Girls, she talked about possibility modeling. Often we have never seen it, so we can't even envision it. So what I'm doing right now is I'm possibility, possibility modeling for the saddies. Girl, there is something else on the other side of your persistently lowered mood. Are you going to be at the baseline of everyone else? I don't know. I was waiting in my 20s for my baseline to improve before I got out there. I, I learned over time that life is not about waiting for the waves to stop. Life is about learning how to surf. My life is a persistent choice to be the best surfer with the cutest surfboard ever. I run into the waves now, okay? I run into the waves. If you're a Christian, Paul said, God, take this thorn away from me. And God was like, listen, my grace is sufficient. What are you talking? God said these waves aren't going to stop. Yes, I'm mixing metaphors, but hopefully you get it. Learn how to surf. Okay. Next thing is I had to ask myself if I was too focused on the past. Rushni. Okay. I'm about to get a little woo-woo right now. If you don't like woo, I'm sorry, but this is where we are. This helped me and I hope it helps you. The only thing you have is now. The present is all you have. The past happened and only lives in your memory. The future has not happened yet. Depressed people have a tendency to spend all of their time in their minds, which is what goes to the past and the future. Yes? Your body's not going to the past. Your body's not going to the future, okay? Your body is in the present and you're neglecting your body. This is gonna sound crazy, but I'm trying to tell you what I know. The present version of you, your mind has left the building. It's ruminating in the past. It's ruminating in the future. Meanwhile, your body is here in the present because it can't go to the past and the future being neglected. I started asking myself, am I spending too much time in the past, which is in my mind, I'm out here going into the past. Am I spending too much time in the future? Am I neglecting the only thing that I have is now, this present? If you've coached with me, you've heard me say that life is a succession of nows. This is all we have. If you're sitting here watching me live or if you're watching me on the replay, hello, as Stephanie Perry says, um, this is all we have. What happened to you yesterday doesn't exist anymore, boo-boo. The effects of it exist. What ha what's going to happen to you tomorrow? God spare life does not exist anymore, boo-boo. But guess what? Now exists. So if you want to have a different experience of the effects of what happened to you in the past, you have to make a decision in the now. 
And if you want to have a different experience in your future, which you are creating with every present choice, you have to make a different experience in the now. I had to teach myself that. I had to start looking at time differently. This is the woo-woo part, but hopefully this is, listen, if this helps one woman, get up, okay? That's why y'all are like, Rushni, how is the twist out doing what it's doing and the pineapples are doing what they're doing? And why are you so cute? And I'm like, because now is all I have. Did I put on perfume for this live when I'm sitting in this office by myself? Of course I did. And I'm wearing yellow stretchy capris, okay? If a look from head to toe, boo-boo, because now is all I have. So start making choices. Bring your mind. I'm going to get out of the woo in a second. Depressed person. Is your mind, has your mind left your body and is it in the past? Come back here. Has your mind left your body and is it in the future? Come back here. Get, get, back. get back in here. Make a different choice in the now. And oftentimes, there are such small, tiny choices. Remember I told you guys, don't knock small things you haven't tried. Don't, don't do it. Do I have multiple water bottles sitting here? Yeah. Because I stay hydrated. Okay. You know why? I don't like how I feel when I don't hydrate. Okay. Anybody trying to live that dehydrated life? I'm not. So in the moment, I drink the water. I make the choices in the now. Okay. Let me look. Okay. I got to go. Let's, let's go. I'm trying to wrap it up. This is a long one, but hopefully it's tight and it's right. And I'm going to help you manage this depression. Okay. This is a big one. I got two more things and then I'm going to go. The next thing I had to do was understand that my expectations were the root of a lot of my problems and that I had very unrealistic expectations for life in general and for the outcomes of things and for how things were to be um, done in my life. Why rush me? I was not modeled possibilities. I was not modeled a growth mindset. If you remember at the beginning of this video, I said that if your parents were depressed and if your parents' parents were depressed, you studies show that you have a higher percentage chance of being depressed. Not necessarily only because of biological markers, although that can be a factor, but mostly because of poor modeling. You never saw it. So you never even learn the skills. I never saw, how do I say this? Realistic and healthy elevated mood modeling, emotional regulation, how to move yourself from a triggered or emotional state. I didn't even know what a triggered or emotional state was, okay? Y'all hear me saying all these big words like I studied or whatever? That's because I did it on my own. I figured it out with the help of God and all these therapists, okay? And an insatiable appetite for this type of information because I needed to heal myself and I also needed to help other people heal. So hopefully y'all are, hopefully this is helping you, okay? I never saw it. So I didn't, I had, my default was just a library of unrealistic expectations. And when you are, thrust into adulthood with unrealistic expectations, then when those unrealistic expectations for how things work in life don't come to pass, you can get really pissed off or you can get really depressed. And I went to the really depressed space, okay? I actually looked this up to see if this was just me. No, no, no. Apparently, this is proven by studies, people who live with depression tend to have, I wrote it down, expectations as a filter for how they judge things, faulty expectations, unrealistic expectations of things, right? And it says here that there's a huge impact of unrealistic expectations on their relationships. Now, listen, this one actually shocked me because I had already come up with this on my own. If you've ever heard me talk about intention versus capacity on my platform, it's this. What is that, Rushni? Okay. Everyone isn't doing everything to you intentionally. Often we think they are. Somehow we come out 
learning that everything is intentional. I spoke to you guys about this earlier, about this lens of thinking that everything is about me and people are intentionally coming against me and the job is intentionally, intentionally, intentionally. No, no, no. Sometimes people, jobs, environments that you are in have a certain capacity and they have hit that capacity. So let's say, for example, you are in a job, the environment sucks, the social situation sucks, the mental health situation in there sucks, everything sucks, and you are in there trying to get water out of a stone, blood from a stone. It's not there. They're not intentionally hurting you. It's not there. You have an unrealistic expectation. I like the mic for this now. Boo boo. You have an unrealistic expectation of that situation. You need to extricate yourself from a situation because your, ex your expectations are unrealistic. Same thing with a relationship, okay? Um, you trying to get loving kindness and physical touch and understanding and emotional regulation and feeling seen, heard, and valued, and it's not there. They can't give it to you, okay? I remember one time my pastor did a sermon. He said, you know what um, a person is? A person reveals themselves when they're squeezed. He said, when you squeeze an orange, you to get orange juice. When you squeeze a lemon, you to get lemon juice. Right? If if this person has been put under pressure with you and nothing's coming out, all you got is air pie and wind sauce. You have unrealistic expectations. If you keep going back to what I call a dry well, I call that a dry well. If you heard me talk about dry wells, that's what I mean. You have unrealistic expectations, right? People with depression, I had this. This is something I had to learn. If I keep going back to a dry well and thinking I'm going to get water, now I'm choosing to have this poor experience. Why, Rushni? Because wells are supposed to have water in it. And I'm not saying that this person or this person or this experience or this thing in this role wasn't intended to meet that specific need. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if you know, fool me once, shame on me. No, fool me once, shame on you, but fool me Two, three, four, 57 times shame on you. Okay, I got to go because I, listen, I got a kid to get off the bus. The last thing I want to say, and this is the last thing, and then I'm going to go, you guys. Hopefully, this is helpful. This is long, but I'm hoping it helps. The last thing that I do that's very important, and I went into this much more in last week's video about sleep. So I'll put a uh, link to that video because I went a lot more in depth. I got to go. Okay. I got to go. I told y'all I'm a special needs mom, and I got actually, I actually have to parent my child. Okay. I ask myself, what do I need right now? People with depression, we default to neglecting ourselves. It may be learned, like I said, about poor modeling. Maybe you watched somebody, especially if you are a Black woman. It's very likely that you watched Black women in your family of origin neglect themselves and be celebrated for it. I would be actually shocked if you grew up in an environment where you were modeled tending to your needs. That causes depression, you guys. And you can make a different choice. That's what I'm going to say. So I start asking myself what I need. And the way that I do it that's more, most thorough for me is I run through my senses. What do I need to see right now? Maybe I say, what do I need to hear right now? Maybe I say, Rushni, what do you need to smell right now? Rushni, what do you need to feel right now? Rushni, what do you need to taste right now? Rushni, what do you need to perceive right now? I'm giving you permission to ask yourself those questions and then provide for yourself the answer. Remember what I said, don't put it in somebody else's hand. It's not going to get better. They ain't coming to save you, okay? Boo-boo, save yourself. Save yourself, okay? They're coming to align with you as you save yourself, but they're not coming to save you. They're not, they're not coming. They're not coming, okay? So what do I need to see right now? Maybe I need to turn on the lights in this room because I've been in the darkness. Maybe I need to turn on my light box because I feel my mood getting low. Maybe I need to just go sit in the sun. Maybe I need to watch my favorite movie. I don't know. What do I need to hear right now? Maybe I need to blast soca or dance hall in my spirit until I reactivate, okay? Until my Caribbean, my Caribbean essence reactivates. Maybe that's gonna, maybe that's what I need, 
Okay. Maybe I need to hear something positive said. I have called my best friend before and said, girl, I just needed to hear your voice. I said, girl, say anything at this point. You could read the flipping periodic table to me. Your voice calms me down. Your voice tells me there's somebody on my side. Just say words to me. And guess what? She's done the same thing to me. What do I need to hear? What do I need to smell right now? I've told you guys, I am very big on the smell goods. Okay, there's a diffuser going right over there. It's shaped like a pineapple because why not? Okay. I was at my ADHD testing and the psychologist had a pineapple shaped diffuser on her desk. And I was like, forget this ADHD testing. Where you get that from, girl? <laughs> I know it's mine. Okay. I have diffusers. I have candles. I told you I put perfume on for myself to sit here and talk to a camera. What do I need to smell right now? I went into this more in the sleep one. All of these sensory things help to do exactly that. They help to calm and regulate your senses. It's very self-configured. Um, your What you need is not going to be what anybody else needs. What do I need to taste right now? Maybe I need some water. Maybe I need to eat one of my favorite snacks. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm craving brisket. Maybe brisket's going to do it. Okay, maybe the IHOP steak tips and eggs is going to revolutionize my life right now. Okay? Which one? What do I need to touch? Maybe I need to put on a different outfit. Maybe this, the neck, the thing on this, the neck on this shirt is choking me to death. Maybe I, you know, this is, these pants are uncomfortable. Maybe I need to put on cute. The other thing, listen, for me, it's big on like what I look like. Okay. When I'm depressed, sometimes I look in the mirror and I'll be like, who is that? I don't know her. Let me go ahead and find Rushni right quick. I have a part-time job. And one time my boss asked me to jump on a call, right? It's a remote, mostly majority remote workforce. He asked me to jump on a call in Slack last minute. I turned on the camera. He saw this, like literally like this. That man said, I'm sorry, ma'am. Why do you look like that at home sitting here? And I said, I stay ready so I don't have to get ready. Okay. And the last one, what do I need to perceive right now? What is perception? Perception is your sixth sense. Perception is the, the, the overall, it's the vibe. It's the vibe, okay? It's the essence of an experience. It's your spiritual and your mental experience, okay? So do I need to feel connected? Do I need to feel loved? Do I need to feel seen, right? And when I ask myself these questions, I then create create. I don't wait for, I don't sit there and say, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, nobody sees me. No, I need to feel seen. Well, what can I do to feel seen? I ask myself these questions. Um, I always tell people that on the other side of uh, fear is missing information. I heard a quote recently that said that uh, fear is excitement without the breath, which I thought was amazing. Okay. I think there's a lot of stuff that can be solved <laughs> with asking another question. Just ask one more question. You feeling fearful? Just ask yourself one more what if question. You're feeling depressed? This helps with your perception. Ask yourself one more what if question, right? Do I need to change my attributional style? Do I need to pull up this video that this chick on the internet with the pineapple earrings was talking about and run that stuff back and be like, girl, are you making this all about yourself? Are you making this permanent when it's not like, girl, the last time you felt like this, you can't even remember why. Like, do I need to talk to myself? Do, like, what do I need to perceive right now and then provide it for me? OK, anyway, this is the longest live I've done. But listen, I hope it's helping somebody. If it helped you, please let me know in the chat. I got to go because like I've told you guys, I'm out here living this special needs mom life. Two things. First thing is I have mentioned that I have a coaching community for Black women who are healing. It is Find Your Light. It's on the screen. Bit.ly slash Glamazzini. Find Your Light. If you are a Black woman on a healing journey, it's 800 plus women strong. And um, I have picked it back up. I had kind of slowed it down. I picked it back up. We out there living our best healed and amazing life. Please come join us. The other thing is I made a free gift for you guys. I've been telling you guys about this. 
It is one of the most powerful things that I've worked with with my previous coaching clients. It is the Who Am I Identity Workbook. Let me find it here in my cute little banners. I'm just going to put it on the screen. I'm not going to put the picture. You can download a free copy of the workbook. What is it, Rushni? If I asked you, who are you? Could you answer? I promise if you're depressed, you probably can't. If you're depressed and you're watching this, go get your workbook, please. Glamathini.com slash who am I? Just trust me. Just, just get your book. Okay. This is part of the stuff that I've done. I put it in a book. It's helping you answer one of the most important questions that you're ever going to be asked. Not for other people, but really for yourself. Because once you can answer the question of who you are, you start creating your life. Your life. Not the life your mama told you. Not the life you think you're supposed to be because you're a Black person. Not the life you think you're supposed to create because you're a mother or because you're a woman or because you're American or because you're in your 40s. You start creating your life, okay? So you can download this book for foi. It's an ebook at glamazini.com slash who am I? Okay, that's it, you guys. You s- <laughs> Unfolding Mystery says from a saddie, this was on point. I'm trying to help the people, okay? People say to me all the time, Rushni, how? This video is how. This video is how you guys see me doing the things with a 20-year-old and two month old depression diagnosis, major depressive disorder. Okay, you guys be well, be encouraged. Here's a pineapple. Bye you guys.